Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to begin here this evening by thinking for a minute or two about how our bodies work. In particular, I want us to think for a minute or two about why the various parts of our bodies do what they do. For example, why do your lungs continually expand and contract, drawing in oxygen-rich air and then forcing out air that is rather full of carbon dioxide? Why do your lungs do that? Or to give you another example, why does your liver, which is a truly remarkable part of your body, by the way, why does it remove toxins from your blood, maintain healthy blood sugar levels, regulate blood clotting, and perform hundreds of other vital functions that the internet told me that your liver does? Why does your liver do those things? Now, the answer to these kinds of questions may be rather obvious, and this may all sound rather silly, but it's important for our consideration here this evening. Your lungs and your liver do these things. They do what they do because that is what your body, the rest of your body, needs them to do. In other words, your lungs and your liver don't do these things, let's say, for their own selfish purposes. Your lungs don't draw oxygen into your body and exhale carbon dioxide because they find this process particularly fulfilling and enjoyable. Your liver doesn't do all the things that your liver does because it just likes to be busy and didn't have anything else happening to be going on. Your lungs and your liver do what they do because these are the things that your body needs them to do. And the same is true, you could say, for every other organ in your body. The various parts of your body, your lungs and your liver and everything else, they naturally serve the other parts that make up your body. It's what they were created to do. It's how your body was designed to work. Each part of your body serves the rest of your body. Now, like I said, this explanation for why the various parts of your body do what they do may seem rather obvious, and they may, this may seem like a silly thing to be, even be talking about here this evening, but the point is important for our consideration. This point is important for our consideration here this evening because in our epistle reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul teaches us that it is necessary, absolutely necessary, that we discern the body when we come to the altar and partake of the meal, the Lord's Supper, which our Lord Jesus instituted on this very night some 2,000 years ago. For anyone, Paul says, who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And in case you don't take that seriously or don't think it's a big deal, he goes on and he says this, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Discerning the body when we take Holy Communion is a big deal. But what does it mean? What does it mean to discern the body? Traditionally, this phrase, discerning the body, in Holy Communion, in the Lord's Supper, has been understood to include three things, three things all at the same time that make up what it means to be discerning the body. First, it means discerning or recognizing that the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are in fact present under the bread and the wine in Holy Communion. This is crucial. If we do not believe that the bread and the wine are in fact the body and blood of Jesus, if we believe that they're, let's say, just symbols which happen to represent the body and the blood of Jesus in some way, then we're not discerning 
the body. We're not taking Jesus' word seriously when he says, this piece of bread is my body, and this cup of wine is my blood. And if we're doing that, if we're not taking his word seriously, then we're not receiving the sacrament properly. Secondly, discerning the body in Holy Communion, in the Lord's Supper, means desiring the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation which Jesus offers to us here in this sacrament. The body and blood of Jesus, which we receive under the bread and the wine in this sacrament, they, of course, give these gifts to us, forgiveness, life, and salvation. They forgive our sins, give us eternal life, and save us from sin, death, and the devil. Failing to desire these gifts, acting like, well, those things don't really matter, or I don't really need that, would be another example of not discerning the body. And thirdly, discerning the body in Holy Communion means recognizing that we, each and every one of us gathered here this evening, every member of our entire congregation here at St. Luke, and for that matter, all the Christians living in the world, all the Christians even both living and dead, all of us are the body of Christ. Discerning the body means recognizing that we are the body of Christ. Now, in the Lutheran Church, we tend to emphasize those first two aspects of discerning the body that I just talked about over the third one. We tend to focus on the first two more than we talk about the third one. We tend to emphasize, and to a certain extent, rightfully so, the presence, the real presence of Jesus' body and blood in the sacrament and the gifts of forgiveness and life and salvation that come along with it. Rightfully so. But as we do that, we sometimes forget or neglect to talk about or pay attention to the fact that we also ourselves are the body of Christ. When the Apostle Paul wrote these words, which we find in our epistle reading this evening, to the Christians living in Corinth, his main goal was to remind them that they are the body of Christ. In the verses right before our reading this evening, this is what the Apostle Paul said to the Christians in Corinth. This is the, these are the words that immediately lead up to our reading today. He says this, he says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each of you goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you for this? No, I will not. Just like every other Christian community at that point in time in history, the Corinthian Christians to whom Paul was writing, they didn't have a church building like we have. They met in people's homes, and they did their church services in people's homes. They did their communion services in people's homes. And their communion services were usually part of a larger, more extensive meal. And that was all fine and dandy at first, but somewhere along the way, things kind of got off the rails in Corinth. Those in the congregation who were wealthy and were able to bring a good deal of food to these meals that were happening in their church services as they celebrated the Lord's Supper, those who were wealthy and had plenty to bring, they brought lots of food. But they didn't necessarily share what they brought with those who came and happened to have less. And those who had free time and were able to come early, they came early and they got the meal started before other people who were perhaps still working were able to come. They didn't wait for each other. 
And the result was that some people at these communion services were getting drunk, while there were others who went away hungry. And the problem that's underlying all of this, Paul says, is that they are failing to discern the body, that they're failing to recognize each other as fellow members of the body of Christ and live like it. And as a result, Paul says that the meal which they were eating when they gathered together was not the Lord's supper. It was a supper, all right, but it wasn't the Lord's supper. Now, for us today, we might like to think that we've solved this problem. After all, in our communion services, you could say that everybody kind of goes away hungry. You only get a little piece of bread about that big. It's not going to satisfy anybody. And nobody gets drunk because we give you about that much of a little bit of sip of wine. But before we get too far along with congratulating ourselves and patting ourselves on the back for this, I think we should probably stop and ask ourselves whether or not we can say that we're always discerning the body, remembering that we are the body of Christ and living like it when we come to communion. The various parts of the body, remember, were created to serve one another. Your lungs breathe in oxygen and your liver filters your blood because that's what the rest of your body needs those organs to do. The various parts of your body serve one another. That's what it means to be a body. And the same is true in the body of Christ. Being a member of the body of Christ means serving one another. When Jesus, in our gospel reading this evening, wraps a towel around his waist and begins to wash the feet of his disciples, he gives us a picture of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. Jesus, of course, is the head of the body of Christ. He is the head, and all of us together, we make up the rest of the body. But look at what Jesus, the head, is doing He's washing the feet, quite literally, of the body. He, the highest and most critical member of the body, is stooping down and doing the lowliest and most humble job. Why? Because this is what the body needs him to do. Because this is what it means to be a member of the body. And Jesus calls us here to imitate him. A new commandment I give to you. He says that you love one another just as I have loved you. The various parts of the body serve each other. That is what it means to be a body. And that begins first and foremost with Jesus, our head, serving us. Not just by washing our feet or something like that, but by giving his life for ours on the cross so that we could be members of his own body, so that we could receive his body and his blood given and shed for us for the forgiveness of sins in this sacrament. Now, the way that we do communion services today in our church is effective in eliminating the problems that were going on at Corinth. Nobody gets drunk. Everybody has the same amount of food to eat. But at the same time, The way that we do communion services can still lead to us failing to discern the body. Rather than a a big family meal, which is kind of like what was supposed to be going on back then in Corinth, the way they did things, rather than a big family meal or a supper, our way of doing communion services today can sometimes lead to us thinking of communion as something that's a little bit more like a drive through In a drive-thru, you don't really know the people in the car in front of you or the people in the car behind of you, and you're not really worried about either of them other than the person in front of you just want to get out of the way so that you can get your food. That's how drive-thrus work. Everyone, yourself included, is just there for the food and wants to leave as soon as possible. 
And we can be tempted to come here to the Lord's table in a similar kind of way. Now, I'm not suggesting that we change how we do communion services or anything like that. What we've got and what we do is a good tradition that's been passed down to us. But I do think that it's worth taking the time to be thoughtful and to think about how it is we go about discerning the body in our life together here as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of the body of Christ. How is it that we go about discerning the body and living like members of the body? This kind of thing requires time and patience. It requires intentionality as we look for ways to serve one another, as we look for the things that our brothers and sisters in Christ, our fellow members of the body, need us to do for them. And more than anything else, it takes the forgiving love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the very night on which he was betrayed gave us his own body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of our sins in this sacrament that we call the Lord's Supper. He's the one who makes us members of his body. And it's his love that will continue to renew our love for one another so that we, as members of his body, may serve one another in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand as we